Our scripture lesson today is good news from um, the book of Colossians. This is the um, word of God to the early uh, church in Colossae, and let's share in God's good word together. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You can be better in 2021. You can be better in private, in your thoughts, in what you choose to dwell on, in your language to yourself, and even to that driver in front of you. You can be better. We can be better together. And as you become better, stronger, more at peace, in private, it will begin to change who you are in person with others. Your inner self determines your outer self and ultimately your public self. Today is the first Sunday of a new year, 2021, and we are praying not only that 2021 is better, but that we are better too, in private, in person, and in public. 2021 only gets better if the people living on the planet choose to become better, and that includes you and me. We have that choice right now, but it's not always easy. I love the story, and I hope it's true, of a woman who sees a father shopping with a fussy little two-year-old in his grocery cart. Be patient, Johnny, he whispers. It won't be long. You can handle this, Johnny. It's okay, Johnny. And the woman said to him, I don't mean to bother you, sir but I just had to tell you how wonderfully patient you are with little Johnny. And the man replied, actually, ma'am, my son's name is Mark. My name is Johnny. Friends, this new sermon series, Better, our goal is not to become more religious, not for what other people think. It is to have a life worth living that honors God and blesses others with our real life in the grocery store and wherever we go. In the next three weeks, we will learn how to do just that. So let's get started. First of all, I want you to know about our new app. We have a brand new app. It says Acts 2 United Methodist Church. And there you can download all our sermons and our sermon notes. And this is very cool. As you will follow along in the sermon notes, as you start to type in the blanks, what do you know? The app will fill it in for you with the correct answer. How about that? So even the app might help us be a little better this year. So this is our new sermon series, Better in Private, in person, in public. And of course, these sermons will build on one another because what you do in private will be revealed who you are in person. And then, of course, that will be revealed in your public life as well. Maybe you've spent some time with family over the last few weeks. I know I have. And one of the things that used to happen uh, in my family is that when I'm around someone, I sort of pick up their accent or I pick up some words or phrases that they use. The people that I work with, my vocabulary changes by the people that I run with. Maybe that's true with you as well. And so every once in a while, I can talk to someone and I know, oh, they've been with their mom. Or, oh, they've been with their cousins. Because the way they act, they're either lifted up or maybe they're more dismayed or maybe their life is a little more chaotic or maybe they're just sad because there are people who feed life into you and there are people who drain you and the thing is we become so often like the people we hang out with and I just wonder if like in the Bible when someone looked at Moses they said wow Moses has just been with God we can see the presence and goodness of God on him wouldn't that be cool I'm praying that in this coming year people will be able to look at all of us and go that looks like someone who's been in the presence of Jesus. They've been changed by His goodness, by His mercy. And, and this is such an important series, friends, because what John Ortberg says is true. What matters most is not what you accomplish in this life. It's who you become. It's who you become. It, it's not what you accomplish. It's who you become. And that is so very, very important because that person that you're becoming, that lasts forever who you really are. It lasts forever and ever and ever. And this is true for every person on the planet. Everyone on the planet has an inner life, a soul, a spirit. Everyone has an inner life, 
a spirit, a soul, that is being formed for better or worse. You are being formed right now for better or worse. Everything you see, everything you hear, everything you watch on TV, everything that you read, it's forming you, your inner person, your inner life. So we want to be wise about what and who we're becoming. So let me ask you, since you do have a soul, since you are a soul, since you have a spirit, you also have a body and all this works together, but who you're becoming lasts forever. So let me ask you, how's your spiritual life going? On a scale of one to 10, one being, yikes, I don't want to talk about it. I'm turning you off right now. Uh, or 10, couldn't be better. Well, friends, if, if you're a 10, I would love to meet you. Um, most of us are not one and we're not at 10. But I just, you know, if you have the sermon notes, you might just circle one of those and just think about where you are currently and maybe where you'd like to be uh, by the end or this time next year. But isn't that tricky? You're like, well, how, Pastor Mark, I mean, you're just being said, how do you do that? Uh, isn't God the, the one that judges us? Sure, but friends, you can't change what you don't measure. So think about where you are, where you'd like to be, and how do you actually measure the health of your soul, of, of how you're doing, how you're becoming? And so one of the great mentors in my life, as many of you know, is Dallas Willard. And so he had a few questions for people um, to ask themselves. One of those questions is this. Am I growing more easily irritated these days? Are you? Am I growing more easily irritated these days? The second question is, am I growing more easily discouraged these days? That's a good question too. Am I growing more easily discouraged these days? And so over the last week or two, if you're more irritable or you're more discouraged, there's good news. There's hope. Because oftentimes, um, the reason I get discouraged is because I forget the power and presence of God all around me. I forget that God is all-powerful. And when I get irritated, it's really that I forget how much God loves me and has sacrificed for me and for all the world. I don't have anything to worry about. I have no reason to be irritated. Um, it's normally because I'm not getting my way, right? My agenda has been thwarted. So there are two gifts um, that I want to share with you that come from God or they're results of connecting with God. They're a byproduct or a fruit, if you will. And these are the love of God and the peace of God. These are so powerful that they change your life. They change the lives of those around you, of anybody that comes in contact with you. The love of God and the peace of God. And it works like this. So if, if God's love is growing in me, I'm less irritated because the most important thing about me is that I'm loved by God. And nobody can change that. God's not mad at you. He loves you. And because the God of the universe who created the heavens and the earth and the planets and all the people in the world, he chose to create you and thinks you are beautiful and wonderfully made. Awesome. Good. He says you are very good. If God's love is growing in me, I am less easily irritated. What could possibly bother us if the king of the world and all the universe loves us? When that is first in our minds, we're less irritated, certainly less offended. Um, we don't engage in nonsense on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. We don't have to do any of that because our first identity is one who's loved by God. The other is if God's peace is growing in me, then I'm less easily discouraged because it is the peace that passes all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of Christ is available to you today, right now, no matter what you're going through. And so many of us are going through such a very difficult time. We have members of our church family that have lost one and two and three people in their family systems, people they love dearly. And they're having a hard time and they need this peace of God, not because of their circumstances, but right in the middle of it. And I want you to know it's possible. Uh, again, Dallas Willard, he says this, there is a way of spiritual transformation that is accessible to all people. Yep, so if you're listening to this today, it's accessible to you. You have the ability to have a better life this year. Spiritual transformation is accessible to all people and it really does work in the contemporary world. Dallas wrote an entire book called The Spirit of the Disciplines and he can walk you through step by step all the things um, that the Christian church uh, has done over centuries and millennia to grow closer uh, with Christ and a deeper connection with Jesus. 
And here's the thing about it, though. We have to do it in truth. Remember that Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and life itself. So the path starts where we are and as we are. No pretending, no presuming, no, no faking it, right? The path starts where we are and as we are, no matter what. Even if you're in despair, you got to start where you are. Even if, um, you know, you're having a hard time, you got to start where you are. Wherever you are, that's where we start, and it is accessible to you. The God of the universe is as close as your breath, as close as your next prayer. But the problem with such uh, things like spiritual growth and spiritual life is that we oftentimes will look at other people and we think, well, I don't measure up to that or I could never do that. Or I hear that other people talk to God or they, you know, they say that God spoke to them. I don't know how to do that. Well, friends, here's the thing in the spiritual life and in all of life. And that is that comparison kills spiritual growth. It kills your joy. Comparison kills spiritual growth, joy, life, peace, happiness, all of it. When you start looking at somebody else's life and you don't think you measure up or you think they've gotten it easier, if they've gotten a better deal, then all of this starts to break down. We have to start as we are, where we are, and we can't compare ourselves to anyone else. So, because that'll just stop it right in its tracks. The other thing that I want to make sure we get right, right at the first, is this, that we're trying to be better, not better than. Will you say that with me? Better, not better than. And this is so important because, as we just said, comparison is the killer of spiritual health and life and growth. It's also the killer of your joy. Henry Nouwen, um, who's a theologian I, I love to read, he says this, Spiritual greatness has nothing to do with being greater than others. Nope. It has everything to do with being as great as each of us can be. And so when we measure how irritable we are or how discouraged we are or how helpful we can be to others, we measure this, not what anybody else does, but where we've been in our own lives. And hopefully, um, we will grow in our faith life. And, and here's, here's the tragic thing that I've learned over 20 plus years of ministry. There are some people in their faith life that have basically developed about three years. And they, they just have stayed a three-year-old their entire faith life. And that's it. They, that's all they wanted to do, and they just called it quits. And, and they've done these same three years over and over and over and over and over again. And they know what they know, and they're not really open to knowing anything else. And they are just stuck at three years old in their faith development, regardless of their age. There are other people, even if they're young, that they have been committed to allowing Jesus to have his way with them, whatever it is, however God wanted to grow them. And, and even at ages 16 or 18 or 20, they're 20 years mature in their faith because they've allowed God to grow them and they've been intentional about getting better and closer in their walk with Jesus. Now, this is an important piece. And that is we can only do this if we have a right understanding of who God is in the first place. And so I want to beg you, do not be afraid to connect with God and to receive the life-giving spirit of Jesus. Don't be afraid to connect with God and receive life itself because Jesus is life itself. God is the giver of all life. And so the scripture that we read just a minute ago comes from Colossians and it says this. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Now, in this context, the word above is heaven. And heaven is that place where what God wants done is done. It's where Jesus reigns at the right hand of God. And so every time you see above, in this context, in, in the letter to Colossae, um, we want to know that this means heaven. Uh, and you can participate in heaven today. It's not something you have to wait for until after you die. It's something that's available to you right now. And you'll see why. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above the things that Jesus is doing. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We have access to the life of heaven, this word above, where Jesus rules because he's raised, because of Christmas and because of Easter. In the same way that Christmas is not just one day, right? Christ is with us always, Emmanuel. Easter resurrection is not one day that is a historical fact that we remember. It is historical fact that we remember, but not just that. It's also something we can live into every day, something you can live into right now. So since we have access to the life of heaven, the life of Jesus, the resurrected one, we are to pursue this access. 
It's not something that we're supposed to just know and leave alone. It's something we're supposed to live into. We have this access of the very power of the heavens that we can talk to God himself through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we connect with that power, we can connect that right here today and bring heaven to earth as God's conduit of his love. And that's what the church is to be, the hands and feet of Christ in the world. So we have to get this right. There is no threat from Jesus. There's no threat from above. Even when he was on the cross, he was forgiving the thief next to him. Jesus is perfect love and perfect goodness and perfect kindness. There is no threat from above since Jesus who raised us is in charge of heaven. So this Jesus who gave himself for you now reigns in heaven and is accessible to you right now. So you don't have to be afraid of Jesus. He loves you. He's crazy about you. You can't take his eyes off you and gave his very life everything he could good give for you. So, like Christmas, which is bigger than a day, the Easter resurrection is available now because Christ is our life. So in verses 2 to 4, it says this, Set your minds on things that are heavenly, the things of Jesus, the things that are above, not on things on earth. That will depress you. As someone who gets older every year, and I am well past my prime of physical health, if I look at just what's going on with my body every day, I will get depressed it's, it's just depressing because it's going to fade away and turn to dust. It happens to all of us. Now, if you're 16, it's going to get better for a little bit longer. But, you know, once you're past your 20s, it's really hard. So you don't set your minds there. It's just going to be depressing. Set your, things on, your mind on things that are above, on the things of Jesus, on the things of God, of the things of heaven, not on things that are on earth, for you have died. Right? When Christ comes into your life, we've said, okay, I'm gone, Jesus, live in me. So you're dead, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, right, since you've invited him in, Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. You've got nothing to be afraid of, nothing to worry about, but Christ, because Christ, who is your life, is raised and raised in you, and you can participate in what Jesus is doing right now to the glory of God. This is such important and good news. And friends, I pray that you will receive it. But I know that not everyone will. God's love and salvation is for everyone. But we have a choice about whether we receive it. The Jesuit theologian Bernard Lonergan says it like this. Just as insight can be desired, so too it can be unwanted. And I think so often we don't pray to God. We don't come to God. We don't ask God. We don't listen to God. It's not that we don't know or think or have even experienced that God will talk to us. It's that we know that God will. And the insight and the power that God has for us, sometimes we just don't want to see it because we want it our way and we're not really open to God's way. But friends, that is a life of misery. The insight that God has for you today, that you can participate in the heavenlies and the things that God is doing, is the most wonderful news in all the world. The most wonderful thing you could ever participate in. So how do we do it? How do we connect with God and receive this life that Christ came to offer? Well, first of all, we have to listen. Really, we have to get quiet and listen. For God in all the places, all the time, in every place, in every joy, in every pain, we listen for God's voice. We look for where God is and we, we do our best to join him there. Henry Nouwen says it like this. He says, real listening means nothing less than the constant willingness to confess that you have not yet realized what you profess to believe. We have to listen with an openness. We have to hold our beliefs and our thoughts and the things we've been so sure of. We have to hold those lightly and say, Jesus, teach us. Holy Spirit, come. You are the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord God. Teach us what you want us to know, how to live. And so if, if you want to get serious about really listening and learning and being transformed, there are two things you have to do. You have to set apart a time and set apart a place every day to be with God. So set apart a time and a place to be with God and Him alone every day. And for some of you who are parenting, this can be, can be pretty tough. You might actually have to go to your closet and close the door so that you can be alone with God, even for a few minutes. It may mean that you have to get up uh, a little earlier than your family gets up. It might mean that you have to go take a walk in the middle of the day. It might mean that you stay up a little later and have that time with God. But you, if you don't have a time and you don't have a place, it's going to be really hard to hear from the Lord. 
Some people say, well, I've tried, but I'm not hearing them. Well, here are two enemies and two major blockers of our ability to hear from God. They're anger and greed. The two enemies of connecting with God are, same with me, anger and greed. And so if you're angry with someone, it's going to be really hard to hear the loving, forgiving voice of Jesus. And if the only thing you want from God is to give you more money, you're going to have a really hard time hearing from God because God is not in the business of unforgiveness or greed. It's just not who God is. And so if you're struggling to hear God's voice, just know you you got to ask God to help you get these two things out of the way, and then you can hear God again. Again, Henry Nouwen, he says this, The question that must guide all organizing activity in a parish is not how to keep people busy, but how to keep them from being so busy that they can no longer hear the voice of God who speaks in silence. That's the third one. Anger, greed, and busyness. And as a pastor in Edmond, Oklahoma, this has been really challenging because people are so used to being busy and they want to know, well, Pastor Mark, shouldn't we be doing more? And my answer is no. For most of us, we should be doing less because we have to create margin in our life to be able to listen to the Lord. We have to create enough margin so that if God does actually say something to us, we have time and ability to respond. So I want you to think about Jesus. As he begins his earthly ministry, he's baptized by John, and then immediately he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And it's not a punishment. It really drives me crazy that in our culture, aloneness or timeout is thought of as a punishment. It's not. For Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, it's not for punishment. It's for preparation. We need time alone to hear from God and to prepare our hearts for what he has for us to do. So uh, this is recounted in Matthew, and um, I believe it's chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And so if you look there, what you'll see is Jesus not being punished, but preparing. So Jesus' time alone in the wilderness was not a punishment. It was a preparation. The other thing is that as we do this work, it's not about becoming more religious. Uh, We have enough religious so-and-sos in the world. In Jesus' day, they would call those Pharisees. So spiritual health is not about following rules It's about following Jesus because you can follow all the rules and have a hard heart and be far away from Christ. And so it's not about following rules. It's about following Jesus. And so again, when we come to solitude, I don't want you to think about it as being alone, but as being alone with God. You're never alone that Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us is truly with us. And there's lots of ways to connect with God, uh, many of which you can do all by yourself. But you're never alone because God's with you. Never alone. Alone, but never alone. So here's some of them. Look at what you can do. You can go take a walk in nature. You can read scripture. You can exercise. You can have good spiritual friendships. You can serve others. Some people really connect with God when they're serving others. Others connect and worship, which you can do online or here in person. Or... Some people really, really sense God's presence close to them when they have a breakthrough in their study. Not just religious study, but in all kinds of study when they figure out how God's made the world and how it works. It's just amazing. You can imagine uh, when people learned how uh, to create flight uh, or how people uh, learned thermodynamics. When you study and you learn the things of God and the way God has created the universe, it's amazing. Study really blesses me. Art blesses me. Music blesses me. Rest blesses me. Some of these things might bless you as well. Celebration. Did you know that's, that's a thing that connects us to God? Just a, a wonderful party because God is with us. And laughter. I love a good joke. Maybe you do too. These are all wonderful things of God. Just choose one. Pick one. Play with it. You don't have to do it perfectly. Just enjoy what God has given us in this world. Because St. Irenaeus has it right. He says the glory of God is a human being fully alive. God, our, our response to God, our worship, our worship is our full life to God. And so I invite you to live full out for Jesus in joy and to connect with God, have a time and a place. Never be too busy to have a time and a place to be alone with God each day because he's got you he loves you and you can trust him friends this sermon series is so important 
Not, not just because uh, we want to honor God, which is super important. But here's the truth about you. We never attract what we want. We only attract what we are. And so as we get better in 2021 together, it will change your life for good. So for our action steps, there are three things I want to share with you real quickly uh, as we close up today. One is, in our private language to ourselves, I want to invite you to remove the word should from your vocabulary and your thought life. So much shame and blame comes when you should yourself and you think, well, I should have done that. And then you feel badly about it. Well, friends, you don't have to do that. That should is coming from someplace else, either a mom or a grandma or a dad or a granddad or a colleague uh, or a child. Somebody's like, oh, because they're trying to get you to do something. You're on their agenda. And that is a way for a miserable life. So just just don't do it. Um, I have chosen not to say should uh, for the last decade, and it has changed my life for the better. And I hope it will yours as well. So no more should. Do it if you want to do it. Don't do it if you don't want to do it. Obviously do it if you think God's calling you to it. Don't do it um, if you think God is against it. But just take the should right out of your life. Second thing, serious about this, set a time and a place to be alone with God each day. And that place can be sacred. And it can be transformed. It can be at your dinner table. Um, It can be a place in your backyard. It can be a place in your neighborhood. Um, It doesn't have to be miles and miles away. It can be uh, as close as a, as a corner in your office. Uh, but you need that time and that place uh, that you know that's where God meets you each day. And then finally, friends, and this is so important, please be generous with yourself. Be generous with yourself as you try and learn and fail. Because we're not going to do it right or perfectly. Certainly not the first time, maybe not the second or third time. And don't should yourself about it. Don't worry about it. Don't beat yourself up about it. Do what you can. And know that God will meet you there so that you will have a better 2021. Be generous with your friend, yourself, friends, because God is generous. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.